The topics and opinions expressed in the following show are solely those of the hosts and their guests and not those of W4CY Radio, its employees, or affiliates. We make no recommendations or endorsements for radio show programs, services, or products mentioned on air or on our web. No liability, explicit or implied, shall be extended to W4CY Radio, its employees, or affiliates. Any questions or comments should be directed to those show hosts. Thank you for choosing W4CY Radio. Welcome to the Ask the Expert show on W4CY Radio and Talk Board TV, where we bring you educational information from top local experts in the fields of legal, health, financial, and home improvement. Now sit back and listen to experts in family law, association law, hearing loss, business brokers, home care, along with many other topics. Now here are your hosts, Steve-O and Sophia. Hey, good afternoon, Houston. Welcome to another Ask the Expert show where we bring you the top legal experts, health experts, financial experts, and home improvement experts. And I got to tell you, before we get to our show, I want to thank everybody for writing us in, texting us in. I, I am so excited about the amount of people that are watching, listening. And because now that we are so embedded now in the Houston area, we are starting next month going to take calls. We will be taking calls from uh, listeners and you can write your text in. I think the show or the show that's coming up right now is going to be probably the highest rated as to questions because it's a debt relief and tax relief show. And we are so lucky to have one of the top attorneys in the state of Texas. So starting next month, uh, we, this right now, you can actually write us in right now, but we're going to start taking phone calls and I'm going to start taking your texts like we do in our other markets. I want to introduce you. This is, such an easy show to do. A little sad in a way because of the content. And I think once I introduce him to you, you'll understand why. But hey, thank God for lawyers like Dennis Cowan. Because listen, when you need help, you need to go to someone who's really good, somebody you can count on. And what we're doing with this show is we're educating you. So let me welcome you. To attorney Venice Cowan. Hi, Steve O. Great to be with you. I got something. I held this out. I wanted to wait till the show started and I wanted to get a real reaction from you. About two days after our last show last month, I got a phone call from one of your ex clients. And I, I, I probably X is not the way to do it. Uh, you took care of your client so well that they don't need your services right now. But he called me to tell me, he said, I was listening. He calls you Mr. Cowan. He said, I was listening to Mr. Cowan. First of all, you guys did a great job choosing him, which we already knew that already. And he said, he helped me out with my problem when no one else could. And I got to tell you, Finnish, what, what a great compliment. I am. It and, feels good. I mean, yes. And I, I didn't ask him what it was. It's not my business. But the fact that he heard you and I hope he's not your cousin. No, I'm kidding. you. <laughs> it is such a relief when you hear people calling that have used our experts services. And I also, I'm going to throw this in. I'll bet you in the last two months, I have heard from five local attorneys, bankruptcy attorney, four bankruptcy and one uh, enrollment agent. Enrolled agent. Yep. Yes. Who listened to your show, who said they wanted to show like yours, which they can't get, but what a compliment coming from other attorneys in your field. I appreciate so 
and I wanted, I didn't want to write it to you. I wanted to get your true response. And so welcome, welcome, welcome. And finish because we get so many new people every week. Tell everybody about your background and, and your firm. My name is Finance Cowan. I have been a tax lawyer and a trial lawyer for 37 and a half years here in the Houston area. And I really, really enjoy my work. Enjoy helping people. It doesn't always work out. It's okay. It's <laughs> obvious you enjoy what you do. I do. I do. But I, I'm, I'm glad you started off with somebody who was pleased with my work. But as my dad told me as a small boy, after he was in the Marines and for a while he was in charge of the kitchen, and he said, you can't please everyone. That's right. And that's a fact of life. And I got to accept that. And what drove our, my topic today is how to work more effectively with your lawyer, how to get the most bang for your buck and the best outcome. Because it's a two-way relationship, like Great all topic. Real relationships. Great topic. A few weeks ago, I had to let a client go. And it, it was just a lot of unrealistic expectations and perceptions. And he asked for his money back. And I said, if I have to give you your money back, that's fine. I'll do it. But I'm not going to continue helping. I'm not going to work for free here. Impairs my ability to help others. So, uh he parted ways and now he's begging me to, of course, he can't find anybody else to help. Him. And I really could have helped this guy, but for some issues that I'll be discussing here today. So probably the patience is important too, isn't it? Oh, it sure is. It <laughs> sure is. You know, I had a case set for trial this week. I was number 66 on the docket. I wasn't the last one there. So they're trying cases from, 2017, 18, 19, and they, they were shut down for a couple of years. It's going to take them a long time to get caught up. And I had another client this week ask me, can you get me any closer to the front of the line? And I go, nope, you can ask for more time. You can't ask for less time. You're never going to get it. You'll lose, <laughs> you'll lose, lose points with the judge if I file something like that. We're not going to do that. But every lawyer, I'm sure, has had the experience of clients with unrealistic expectations that damaged or ruined a good working relationship or a potentially good relationship or made it much more expensive than necessary. And I want to suggest, have some suggestions for people on how to avoid that. Now, I know it's the client's case. Oh, oh, no. I lost my picture. Okay. Um, and, I, and I'm sensitive to that. And I know a lot of people who come to me have been traumatized or profoundly disappointed by somebody before me. And we all come to the table with, with some baggage. And I accept, I accept that. All my clients are human beings, imperfect human beings. All lawyers are too. Uh, no, it shouldn't be a big surprise. But we meet folks in, in this business who don't appreciate what they face down at the courthouse as far as what's achievable in court or that asking for way too much will alienate a jury and more often than not end up at getting nothing. Uh, you, have your, you have to have a realistic assessment of the case and what remedies are available in the courthouse. I had someone in a contract situation saying, well, if I can't get the liquidated damages and negotiations, we'll go ask the court for them. No, you can't. The court is not empowered to grant those, grant those to you. Uh, and we just deal with that sort of stuff all the time. But people ask, why, why is this so important that you get along with your, with your lawyer and, and with your client and really try? If your client fires you, you're going to have a much harder time finding a replacement. A lot of lawyers, experienced lawyers, will not even consider lawyer clients who've been represented by someone before. I don't believe in that because I've taken over some cases with clients. and With proper management, we've gotten good results. But it's a red flag. It should be a red flag to everyone. If this is a client who stiffed his former lawyer, didn't feel like 
he owed them any obligations and you know expected magic wand treatment make his problem go away without performing his obligation life's just too short um, so i want clients who are teachable who are open-minded have some humility that they don't know know everything about this that's why they're coming to someone who does have 37 and a half years experience and what's the whole saying experience is um, is worth about 25 iq points i've heard that i've heard that uh, from more than one lawyer it's true and i've got my share of those kind of iq points but uh i, I have some suggestions yes, no, no, go ahead you go ahead. ask you a question because you know you i you see these forms that you can buy online uh about you know handling your own case uh and doesn't that I mean, I know there are people who are trying to save money. That, doesn't that just get your goat when, you know, some of these people have ruined their own cases? I ran, and then they incident. come, and then they come to you and want you to bail them out. I ran into that yesterday. Someone had 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 a lawsuit pending, and they wanted they were interested in having me pursue it, but they had already dismissed their case without the magic words, they dismissed it with prejudice, meaning they could not refile it. The case is over. If I file the lawsuit again, the other side would say, the thing has already been decided on the merits. We don't get a do-over. A three-letter word, out, without prejudice, would have made all the difference. So yeah, yeah, the forms- They were trying to pay attorney. Yeah, and I think oh. took, took some advice from someone who didn't know what they were talking about. And it just, I mean, they may be able to refile that case, but it may take a few days in the law library to find out and very expensive and risky to do. Uh, nothing's more heartbreaking than trying a case, taking it up on appeal and getting it thrown out, even if you want it in front of the judge and trial judge and jury. But I wanted to make some suggestions on that initial call because every nobody wants their lawyer more intensely than when they first meet them, when they're first looking for them. So, and that's just, just natural human, human nature. But it's not story hour. Uh, everybody has a story and everybody's entitled to tell their story, but probably not during the initial call before you found out much about the lawyer. And so I have some very specific questions that I need to ask people early on. And one of the reasons I do that, not only to get information, but to assess this prospect and see, is this someone who can listen to a question? Because nothing ticks off a judge or a jury more than a witness who's evasive. And the clients would should be able to understand that. If they asked a lawyer or somebody a, a hard question, they'd expect a direct answer, not an evasion or not a long, long, long story. So I, I've got to cut people off sometimes. And I always explain to them. I say, there's reasons I'm asking this question, but it's usually something like, if it's a legal malpractice case or something, tell me what this other lawyer did wrong in two or three sentences that caused you financial harm. Often they can't answer that question, and that's not going to be a good case. If the, and it's my job to simplify things, but it's their job to tell the story in a way that juries with contemporary attention spans <laughs> will hang on long enough to believe to give them a chance to give us a chance. It, so pretty, that's the first, answer, first thing. One of the Listen things. The I would, one of the things I would think with your practices is getting your potential client to be 100% honest with you up front and not leave anything out to, and expect you to do a great job for them. And all experienced lawyers know that, that they're not going to get the full story at first. And we ask a lot of difficult questions and we want to see the original source documents that sort of thing, because people are mistaken, human memories are fallible. And, uh, but 
we've all had heartbreaking situations like a, the other lawyer calls you up says did you know your client had prior surgery on this part of his body that he's <laughs> complaining about and testified under oath that he'd never had any complaints about it you're lucky if you can get much out of that case but that that's just that's that's something we're trained and determined to weed out and but it, it's we just got a text from a listener love the show great topic uh it, they want to know i guess what he's asking is if there was a law that you could change if there was a texas statue you could change what would that statue be well I'm thinking of a tax statute that got changed, the tax U.S. tax code. I, I'm, I just don't know state laws come to mind, but there is a federal tax change. It used to be that alimony was tax deductible to the person who paid it, and that the recipient of alimony, she, it was usually a she, she was taxable income to her. And that makes sense. It followed good tax policy of taxing the person who actually has the money to pay the tax. And in this case, it'd be the recipient. Um, I'm not sure why they made that other than to just maximize tax receipts, but it made alimony much more taxing to people who otherwise uh, could benefit from, from alimony and stretching out that obligation. And it would sa it save families money. It was a way of kind of making money by saving taxes. Because usually the person paying the alimony is in a higher tax bracket, and the person receiving alimony was in a lower tax bracket. So I thought that law was unfair and inconsistent with good tax policy. So that's an example. There's a... Uh, any other? One, let me just get this listener. He's been... Wade just he wants to know if there is common law marriage in the state of Texas. Yes. Okay. Yes, there is. And there are three elements. Cohabitation, just pretty common. And Live together. Determined living together. The other one is um, intent to be married, mutual intent to be married. And the third one is holding out. The, the, at somewhere along the point, they held themselves out as married to someone else, registered as Mr. and Mrs. on a hotel register, filed a married filing jointly tax return. And that's the three elements of Texas informal marriage, also called co common law marriage. Um, and I've had it come up recently, and they met, they didn't have the holding out. And I said, you weren't married. We can simplify things but it can mean a lot of litigation and a lot of money over that. But if you do intend to be married and you don't want to go through all the ceremonial marriage, there's a way of ending any doubt about it. And it's just filing a form down at the county courthouse. You can register yourself as being married in Harris County or any county with a certificate of informal marriage. And I recommend that people do that and avoid enriching lawyers someday or running into uh, probate problems. Oh my gosh, two thirds of the cases involving family property are uh, second spouse or second or third spouse and the children from the first. And you can imagine that if you've ever been in a uh, uh, step family situation where that dynamic occurs. So I strongly believe in planning in preparation to avoid that type of lawsuit that can be so lucrative to lawyers and so sad and heartbreaking because it is avoidable. Yes. Absolutely. Um, what's a lawyer thinking during the initial interview? First thing he should be thinking is, am I the right lawyer for this prospective client? Often it's not a good fit. And I can tell right away, I'm not the right lawyer for you. Sorry. You know, all the referral service back where I do know someone who would be interested in talking to you and be qualified to help. Uh, I've had clients come to me that drove someone else crazy and I was a better fit and vice versa. So we're all, we're all unique. Um, that's what makes 
horse race is interesting. Um, can I genuinely help this person? Do I have the expertise, the experience? Do I have the bandwidth, the resources, and the time in my schedule to help? Because there's a lot of lawyers who'd be excellent, maybe the best in town, but they're so busy that they're not going to be the best lawyer for this particular case. And I've seen that particularly in someone who had a non-compete case that was going to trial very soon. And of course, there were other more famous lawyers, but I got her the an employment, an employment lawyer who was available and very well qualified, had clerked in that particular court and just got the best outcome. And, but she didn't have to wait. You know, if she waited three months for the number one lawyer in town, she would have lost the case. She, she would not have gotten the relief that she needed because it was very time sensitive. There was injunctive relief going on. So sometimes availability is, is the most important criteria. One thing lawyers, experienced lawyers are looking for is, is this prospect going to cause me more headaches than the potential profit is worth. And some clients are like that. I, you're looking for someone, and I, unfortunately, I don't mean to criticize people, but some people are so needy, they call excessively or email excessively. And that can really run up the bill. To lo and they're surprised that they get charged for time. Well, I spend half of every day on the phone or on, on emails. Abe Lincoln said it best. A lawyer's time is his stock in trade. And if your case is important to you, you want a lawyer who's motivated, motivated emotionally and financially, is enthusiastic about your case, and well compensated. So, or at least has the prospect for being, being that. So we're looking for people who don't accept that reality and they're better off with someone else. Um, we, got we, also look for, we also look for folks who are, I, I know they've maybe just gone through the worst experience, the scariest experience of their life. They're desperate for help, but if they are overly emotional about their case, that can be an impediment to helping them. This, this is, this is a business transaction. You have a case, it's worth some money. You want me to maximize this and we need to present this in court as objectively and unemotionally. Now there's a time for emotion. Injury cases are when we have some sympathy to, to play on. But ultimately, as judges say it, it's about burdens of proof met or not met. So uh, raising your voice with your your lawyer is probably not going to, to help establish rapport. But we have but to have some toleration about that. I just, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six people uh, all are asking for the same thing. And let's keep this in mind. Uh, they would like for your, the next show you do, which you have another show coming up this month, the next show you do, if you could talk more on debt relief as it involves businesses. Okay. So if we well, these are businesses that. with debt. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. So yes. for our next show, maybe we, is there, I guess we could spend a whole lot of time on that, couldn't we? We do. We do. And there have been some interesting changes in that. There were some changes in the bankruptcy code that give businesses some additional relief. And I'll be happy to talk about that. that that's a Well, I got to tell you, when my, my buddy John called up who we've done this together for a long time and he told me about you I said, this is going to be probably the hottest show and i can see by the uh the text message we're getting and but the thing is you're doing such a great job and such a great service give everybody your phone number and your website yes. Dennis. my phone number is 832-341-4555 our, I have two websites. The one on debt relief is Texas Debt, that's spelled D-E-B-T, relief.com. I have a tax website that's uh, Finest Cowan 
dot com. Just my name, F I N I S C O W A N dot com. And there's a lot of useful information on there. Well, as always, you do such a great job. And we will let you know because Finnish is going to be back again with us this month. Have a wonderful, wonderful weekend, Finnish. And thank you so much. Uh, we're going to go to break. When we come back. We have our next unbelievable especially if you snore our next expert will be right back k bender rembaum is a full service community association law firm dedicated to the representation of community associations throughout florida on KBRlegal.com, you can learn more about their offices in Pompano Beach, Palm Beach Gardens, Orlando, Tampa, as well as throughout Miami-Dade by appointment. Several K. Bender Rembaum attorneys are board-certified specialists in condominium and plan development law and assist clients with all matters of community association legal issues while keeping them up to date on new developments that affect their associations. K. Bender Rembaum is also a well-known provider of free legal education for managers and board members. Contact K. Bender Rembaum today by calling 800-974-0680. That's 800-974-0680 to reach any of their locations. You can also visit them online at kbrlegal.com or write to them at info at kbrlegal.com. And we are back with the Ask the Expert show on W4CY Radio and Talk 4 TV with your hosts, Steve O, Sophia, and their expert guests. Hey, and we're back. We are uh, modulating from Houston, Texas today with the Ask the Expert show. I am your host, Steve O. And I guess we are waiting for our guests. Oh, there she is. Hello. <laughs> I, I feel like I just talked to you I several know. minutes ago. I know. Uh, you know, we just started doing our show in, in Houston. And I got to tell I just want to remind everybody, uh, our next guest has come up with a technique that is I am learning more and more about. It. I'm learning so much about it that I, I am going to become a client and I'll bet you I will be endorsing this product. If you have a snoring problem like I do, you don't want to miss today's show. We have got probably, and she's such a sweetheart too, but she has come up with something that I feel like is <laughs> God sent. I mean, if you snore, it affects your relationship it affects your health. I mean, you guys, how many wives said, go in the other room, stop snoring. So we're going to go into that today. And let me tell you something. And this is something she has put together, Janet Bennett. She has put this together. And I'm going to tell you something. Uh, if this works, I, you know, everything I'm learning says it is and she's got so many clients who this has worked for We're, she's not telling you to put the CPAP machine away but this is something that maybe you can wing off that's what I'm hoping for me so let me introduce you to Janet Bennett um, she I, she is a snoring expert especially after we talked today Janet welcome to the thank you. expert. Thank you. Stop. You are God sent. Oh, thank you. Stop snoring Houston.com. I'm glad I'm yes. here today. Yeah. So, you know, we're getting so many new listeners now uh, every week, every month. So please tell everybody about your background and how you got started with sleep apnea. Okay. So I'm a speech pathologist and I've been in private practice for many years. And for the past probably 30 years, I have been specializing in working with people who have a tongue thrust and who snore. 
And you might be thinking, well, what in the world do they have to do with each other? Well, um, a tongue thrust is whenever you, uh, when you swallow, your tongue might put, push the back of your teeth and you might have buck teeth because of that. Or you might swallow with your tongue in between your teeth and you have an open bite. But, but either one of those causes you to breathe through your mouth. So here's the important thing. If you breathe through your mouth while you're sleeping, you are probably going to be heard snoring. So that's, that's the connection there. So that um, when we treat uh, learning how to breathe through your nose, it also helps stop snoring. And, and if you're not snoring and not breathing through your mouth, then there's not going to be any way that you can get sleep apnea. So that's how all three of those are that work together. And so I was um, treating a 14 year old football player and this was in 2003. And uh, I have a seven week program. It's all tongue exercises. And so each week we would meet and learn different exercises and he had to go away and practice them two times a day. Didn't take much time. So on his third week of lessons, he came to my office and his mom stuck her head in my door and she said, what have you done to Adam? And I said, well, what do you mean? And she said, well, he's always been the loudest snorer in the world. The windows would rattle, but now he's not making a sound. And, and I said, well, Adam, tell me more. What's going on? And he said, well, it's true. He said, I'm making better grades. I can concentrate more in school and I run faster. Well, I, I was shocked. I knew nothing about snoring. Absolutely nothing. Especially the run faster. That's right. I, to me, running faster was more important. Um, and so anyway, I, when we were done, I got on the computer, of course, and I knew that when I put in treatment for snoring, that I was going to find that somebody out there was using tongue exercises to teach people to stop snoring. Ha ha, no one mentioned tongue exercises. They, they talked about the CPAP machine, which a CPAP machine can be very, very important and helpful and keep you alive sometimes, you know, it's, and if you can get used to it, it's great. Uh, so they had a CPAP machine. Of course, back then they had these big, bulky, ugly masks too. But um, also they would cut off your uvula. That's that thing that hangs down in the back of your throat. They would cut that off, hoping that that would stop the noise of snoring. Okay. Not even thinking about why are they snoring? What? Okay. Uh, yes, right. Or a dentist could make a $6,000 appliance that would pull your jaw forward so that your airway would get bigger. And I, I, I was just astounded because when I looked into the, um, um, the percentage of success, it, it was hardly any success. And so that was even uh, double, doubly scaring, actually. So I decided that they needed my tongue exercises to learn how to stop snoring. So... I found 86 people all over the United States who would be my guinea pigs and help me word my exercises correctly. I wanted, since I couldn't save the whole world and I didn't want to train the trainers, I decided to produce something online that people could, could have access to and it would be so easy to understand that they would have no problems doing the exercises themselves and stopping snoring. So these 86 people that I treated over a, um, a time of like eight months um, and they helped me word things, 94% stopped snoring. 94% stopped snoring. Now, even today, you go online, go everywhere online, you will not find 94% of any no. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that got me totally excited and now uh, I'm, I've been up and running and it's available and it, it, it's, it's helping people all over the world. Well, I got to tell you, first of all, these exercises, it is, uh, I did my first exercises today and they really make sense. 
And what I discovered is there's things that I'm doing with my mouth, with my tongue that I never even realized I was doing. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm so high on this program, uh, Janet. And, you know, I still think you being a, a speech pathologist had some help in your learning, but, you know, 80, 85, 86%, that is, I mean, no, 94. I would be happy with 70%. No, 94%, Steve. <laughs> 90, that, I'm just saying, what you know what? It's not going to be a, 100%. Right. That's but, the main thing. I don't it's know. It's not going to be a... It could be. And I would, oh my God, that would be well, incredible. What would, okay, so what would keep it from being 100% is if the person didn't really do all of their exercises two times a day. Yes, I could definitely see that. That's right. That's and right. you know what? It, let's go back a little bit because, you know, people, they hear the word sleep apnea. They hear the word, you know, stop snoring. Is there, what's the difference? Well, it's, it's really um, snoring can lead to sleep apnea. That's the key. So a person, for whatever reason, might start snoring, you know, as a young adult and then keep snoring and, and they just, their mouth opens wider and wider right. while they're sleeping. They get louder. The windows start rattling. And anyway, in, in some people, that is going to lead to sleep apnea. So this is how that happens. Whenever you snore, uh, so you lay down, everything gets relaxed, and your gravity will start pulling your tongue down. So it ends up partially blocking your airway. So hence the noise with the snoring and all that, okay? Um, but the more you do that, gravity can uh, jerk your entire tongue down to block your airway. And that's when you stop breathing. And that's when your brain makes you snort to wake up. And that's when you would stop breathing. And some people do that. 60 times an hour or more can you can, literally stop breathing that's right you stop breathing and that's why the, you've got that movement and a snort to wake you up um but every time you do that it damages your heart to some degree so those people who stop breathing five times an hour may have the very same symptoms and we can talk about that later same symptoms as the person who stops breathing 60 times an hour. However, the big difference is the person just uh, stopping five times an hour isn't hurting their heart as badly, okay? So, so it's, it's real important that you uh, stop, stop, stop um, breathing that many times per hour. Um, five, or, five times an hour or under is not considered sleep apnea. That's how harmless that is to you okay yeah janet i got when so i probably have had sleep apnea for probably about 10 years and it can really be dangerous like you say we just told you that you actually <laughs> stop breathing it's very hard on the heart um if you've got high blood pressure you're probably <laughs> going to have sleep apnea but the thing is if you walk into a cvs or Walgreens. They have a, a, a little department for people for stop snoring. And there's things you put tape on your nose. You, I got to tell you, I tried everything. None of those worked. And I finally got a sleep test, found out I had sleep apnea really bad. And I'm being treated with a CPAP now. What I'm trying to accomplish with Janet, because when she speaks, first of all, she's speaking from many years of experience and if i can even if i can get off the cpap machine a couple days and i gotta tell you janet has never ever put down the cpap machine told me to get off of it she has never done that and i never will yeah so i i just want people to know all those apparatuses out there i i never found one that worked yeah Great ads, good ads, but I know you got to take so. care of this. Yeah, and so, you know what? If I just want to say this, I wish I'd have met you about ten or fifteen years ago. Uh, again, I'm not saying this is going to get completely rid of my CPAP machine, 
But if it's going to make my life 50%, 40% better, I'm jumping on that in a minute. Good, good. Well, here are some other things that I would like for the listeners or viewers to think about. If you are sitting here or wherever, standing, whatever, um, listening to me and wondering, hmm, do I have sleep apnea or do I have, do I have a tongue thrust? Or, you know, some people have a lisp and they, they'll say, Thun for sun. Right. So I think most of us, have, we know what a lisp is. And a lisp occurs because your tongue is living too far forward in your mouth. And that's a tongue thrust. And um, most people, not all people, but most people who have a lisp also swallow incorrectly because their tongue's not in the right place. Their tongue's pushing behind their teeth. And that what that means um, and, and it's hard to make this connection for a lot of people, but what that means is when you swallow, you have a weak swallow. Your, your tongue doesn't have the, uh, the roof of the mouth to kick off from. It, it kicks off from your teeth. And, and so what happens is your, your swallow is difficult. It's difficult to make a swallow. You might not be able to swallow a pill and you might cough and you know, do all this stuff. And, and just have a lot of trouble swallowing. So you have to learn where to put your tongue whenever you swallow. A lot of people say they feel something get stuck in their throat here, and that's because they have a weak swallow. All they have to do is learn how to swallow correctly, and it's it, it's easy. Um, it so, really is. Yeah, it really is. Tell, tell the folks. Yes. I'll give you two seconds. Tell the folks what you learned today. Well, I how learned. Learned how that... to what? I've first of all, I've learned techniques today that the tip of my tongue has always been the back of my teeth, where it should be at the top of the roof. There is a place where my tongue should be. And I'm doing techniques that are going to make me because I who whoever thought about where their tongue is. I, I never did. Or if your mouth is open, right. you know, when you sleep. What I learned today, this is just the first day. I learned so many things about myself that I either took for granted or did not know. And I'm saying this really makes sense. This is not some right. kind of a witch doctor. Right. And I am like as excited as I was this morning after hearing, we spent about an hour together today. After hearing Janet's teachings, there, I know this is going to work for me. Good, good. And I'm so excited. And I want it to work. I want to share this. And and I know Jana wants to share this with everybody because it's kind of a tough life when you've got sleep apnea from falling asleep while you're working right. to maybe right. your wife or husband kicking you out of bed. Right. So I know, Janet, you've heard them all. That's right. That's right. So another thing <clears throat> that happens or quite often is uh, very important is that a person has a, a tongue that's too wide for their mouth. A lot of people complain about their tongue feeling that it's just too big for their mouth and they don't know what to do with it. They it really can't go anywhere, you know, so and, and they might accidentally bite the sides of their tongue. And that's because the tongue gets in the way when they talk or chew. And so my program, I um, I knew that and I, I, I trained people to keep their tongue on the roof of the mouth, but it's smaller up there than on the bottom. So we have to make the tongue smaller, skinnier. And so I have actually invented a tongue stick. Couldn't think of another word. Tongue yes. stick. And because but you use it. Trust, a lot of people have never had never even heard of that. I know. So you use it on your tongue in a special way to make your tongue skinnier. I know it sounds crazy. It really does, no, it does. but it, but it works. It, it works. Okay. So you've got um, um, a tongue that's too wide. And, and now we have to think about how you breathe. Whenever you lay down to sleep and your muscles relax, do you find that your lips fall open? A person who snores, they breathe through their mouth. If your mouth is closed, you're not going to be snoring, okay? Um, also, the other thing is when you learn how to swallow correctly, 
that helps you learn how to keep your lips closed. So it's all connected. Whenever I teach somebody how to swallow better, they end up sleeping better and they, they end up uh, speaking better if they have a lisp. So everything's connected. Those exercises, yes, you're right. Speech pathology did help with that because a lot of the sounds that, that um, people have trouble making, especially in R, you know, you've heard kids who say wabbit for rabbit and, and an R it's difficult to tell a person what you're doing with your mouth and, and exercising the tongue, making it stronger and, and more toned is very important and helps kids with other sounds. So I was literally using what I knew about tongue exercises. And then I had to find the right ones that were the most important ones to, to fix the tongue thrust. So that's what those 86 people helped me learn to do. So, um, yeah, yeah, I got to tell you, I mean, and you do like a whole, I would call it like a history and physical before you get started. You've got a lot of questions. That you that's ask. right. And, and the reason is we don't realize the things that are connected with snoring. I'm just going to pick out snoring, but it's also if you have a tongue thrust or sleep apnea too, but a snore um, might have restless leg syndrome. A snore might wake up with a dry mouth wake up with a sore throat that goes away pretty quickly, wake up with a headache that might last 30 minutes. Um, you, you surely will be waking up tired. If you, if you snore, your lips are apart. Oh, I almost forgot to tell you why. Why does that happen? Because when you breathe through your mouth, you get that dirty air in. And, and you don't ah, have, yes. you, you can't filter, you, you can't filter that dirty air. It goes straight into your body. Okay, so when you breathe through your nose, it warms the air, and those little hairs in your nose filter the air, so you get clean, warm air in. I'm going to go a step further. Um, if you need to research this, do that. Nitric oxide, N-I-T-R-I-C oxide, is a gas that we make, and it's normally, most of it is made in the sinus area. So if you breathe it really, our body really needs nitric oxide for many reasons, which you can research. I'm not a doctor, but, but it, it helps to regulate while you're sleeping, the uh, oxygen flowing and uh, blood circulating, just all, all different parts of your body. It, it hits on to help regulate it. But if you breathe through your mouth, your body cannot reach, cannot make, um, contact with that gas right. and so if you breathe through your mouth you are not getting the um the you know the good things that happen when you use uh get nitric oxide when you breathe through your nose you can so that makes all the difference right and so when you are uh, mouth breathing let's go back a few more things you might find that um uh things get stuck in your or you feel like something stuck in your throat you might after you eat a meal, you might feel bloated. I know a lot of people complain of always feeling bloated or having stomach problems after they eat. You know why that happens? Because when you're chewing your food, if you are a mouth breather, you know, when you're chewing food, normally your lips are closed for quite a while, especially if you took a huge bite, okay? And so then uh, if you can't breathe through your uh, nose, you're going to have to open up your lips at some point during that chewing action. So that's why some children smack their lips and the mother, the parents are always, mm, close your mouth, Johnny. <laughs> Don't eat with your mouth open, you know. But what, what is the truth is Johnny can't help it because he can't breathe through his nose and he's got to take air in while he's chewing. So right. parents out there, if you have kids who are, are smacking loud at dinner time, you need to investigate that and see if they can even breathe through their nose. Stop punishing them. Well, right, right, right. But this is called air gulping. So while you're chewing, you're gulping air, and then it gets in your belly, and it makes you bloated. Makes sense. It's You can control it very easily by learning to chew your food with your lips closed. Janet, I love this program. I, I'm glad. I am so easy. excited about it. Do you know, remember, I told you, you only have to exercise two times a day. Right. Right. 
two times a day, and it takes about 15 minutes for you to do your exercises. The exercises and they're easy exercises. They're, they're not they're hard easy, at all. They aren't hard, and they never hurt. Okay, this is important, very important. The other thing that I've done recently is I, I've, I'm always trying to look at ways to help make it easier for those of you who need this program. I have created a website now where um, I share that website address with you, of course, and you go there, um, let's say lesson one, you have three exercises. So you go to that website and you will see me sitting at my desk in my office and I'm waiting for you to join me so that we can do the exercises together. You don't have to know how to do the exercise. You don't have to remember how many minutes you're supposed to do it or how, you know, I will do it and you just copy me. All right. Me, so uh, parents especially love that because they don't, they're not sure they're doing the exercises right. So they feel relieved that Johnny is going to be shown correctly how to do the exercises to practice. And adults feel the same way because, you know, you you always have some sense of, am I really doing this right? I because hate doing so this because our show, every, I mean, I, I've got six people on hold right here. Janet, you're going to be back with us again. Yeah. Uh, you're in our other markets. Give everybody your phone number who's not watching. Okay. It's 828-273-9888 and stop snoringhouston.com. Love it. <laughs> Janet Bennett. Janet, thank you again so much. And you're going to be following my progress. So stay tuned. We'll see you soon. God okay. bless you, Janet. Have a good Thank weekend. You. Okay, you too. Bye. That was uh, Janet Bennett. Uh, folks, give this a shot, please. I mean, it's only for your health. We got to get out of here. We ran a little late today. Thank you, Juan. Have a good weekend. We will see you next week with more Ask the Experts. Thanks for tuning in today to the Ask the Expert show on W4CY Radio and Talk 4 TV. Tune in next week and every week to hear more from our experts on personal injury, insurance, air condition repairs, estate planning, Medicare, and many other topics in the areas of legal, health, financial, and home improvement. See you next week.